webinar. So a good day to everyone. Welcome, everyone. And my name is C.B. Mamrahill, and on behalf of the Systems for Action National Coordinating Center, I'd like to welcome all of you today to today's Research in Progress webinar series on strategies to achieve alignment, collaboration, and synergy across delivery and financing systems. We have a great topic with us today on integrating behavioral health with TANIS to build a culture of health. Uh, before we do get started, though, we would like to acknowledge the funding and support of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, the National Program Office for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Systems for Action Research Program, or S4A for short, is based at the University of Kentucky within the College of Public Health and the Gatton College of Business and Economics. The S4A program conducts rigorous scientific research on ways of aligning uh, the delivery and financing systems that build a culture of health across America. I'd also like to uh, encourage everyone that if you have any questions uh, for our presenters or our commentary speaker today, that at any time during the presentation, uh, we do encourage you to type in your questions at the chat box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. So with that, I'd like to first introduce our presenters for today, starting with Dr. Mariana Chilton, who is a professor at the Dorrance Life School of Public Health at Drexel University. Mariana is director of the Center for Hunger-Free Communities and is co-principal investigator of Children's Health Watch, a national research network that investigates the impact of public assistance programs on the health and well-being of young children and their caregivers. Mariana founded Witnesses to Hunger, a participatory action study to increase women's participation in the National Dialogue on Hunger and Poverty. She's also Principal Investigator of the Building Wealth and Health Network, which is a trauma-informed peer support and asset building program designed to incentivize entrepreneurship and self-sufficiency among families with young children participating in the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families program. Mariana has testified before the U.S. Senate and U.S. House of Representatives on the importance of child nutrition programs and other anti-poverty policies and has served as an advisor to Sesame Street and to the Institute of Medicine. Uh, the other investigator on the project is Dr. Sandra Bloom, who is a board-certified psychiatrist and an associate professor at the School of Public Health at Drexel. In addition, she is president of Community Works, an organizational consulting firm committed to the development of nonviolent environments. Sandra currently works as a distinguished fellow uh, at the Andrus Children's Center in Yonkers, New York. And she's also served as founder and executive director of the Sanctuary Programs, inpatient psychiatric programs for the treatment of trauma-related emotional disorders. In her time in partnership with the Andrus Children's Center, Sandra helped establish a training institute, the Sanctuary Leadership Development Institute, to train a wide variety of programs in the sanctuary model, which is being applied in residential and multi-service treatment programs for children, inpatient mental health programs, schools, domestic violence shelters, group homes, homeless shelters, juvenile justice programs, and schools and communities across the United States and internationally. Providing commentary for today's webinar is Leslie Lieberman, who has dedicated more than 25 years to developing and leading award-winning programs for children and families at the intersection of public health and human services. Currently at the Health Federation of Philadelphia, Leslie leads the Training and Organizational Development Department, which provides professional development and capacity building on public health issues including HIV AIDS and other communicable diseases, trauma-informed care, tobacco cessation, and language access. Leslie has also overseen several special projects focused on creating trauma-informed communities, uh, including the Mobilizing Action for Resilient Communities project and the Philadelphia AIDS Task Force. Prior to work in Philadelphia, Leslie spent more than 15 years in California directing integrated models of care for pregnant women with substance use disorders. Leslie has been invited to speak at numerous national and regional conferences, conducting original research, developed and provided training and consultation on topics ranging from childhood injury prevention to perinatal substance abuse to trauma-informed practice and quality assurance. Leslie's passion is helping others to transform visions into reality and our audience have included administrators, physicians, psychologists, nurses, social workers, teachers, police, child care providers, and parents. So with that, uh, I would like to turn it over to you, Mariana. That sounds great. Thank you so much for the introduction. And hello, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, this is our opportunity to tell you about the uh, – this is our final report for the Systems for Action um, 
program that we've been involved in. The funding ended in July of last summer. And I'm just really delighted to be able to share with you some of our results and some of the new things that we're working out. And I wanted to give a shout out to uh, our, co I think I'm controlling this, sorry, just a second, looking for the arrow. Well, first, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of the system, Systems for Action goals that we set out to do. I'll just do a quick review of TANF and what is trauma and trauma-informed practice. I'll describe the program because I know there's some new people on the phone who haven't heard about this program, so I'll tell you a little bit about what it is. I'll tell you about our outcomes um, that are currently being reviewed in, by peer reviewers, so there are, we're, we're bringing our results to publication, and I'll tell you about some of our next steps. I wanted to give a shout out to um, our co-investigators and to Sandra Bloom, our co-PI, who's not on the phone with us today, but Jerome Dugan and Layla Boucheri, who are our co-investigators, are on the line and also available for questions. Um, also, this program would not have been possible at all without an incredible team at the Center for Hunger-Free Communities and the Building Wealth and Health Network. That's Kevin Thomas and Ali Huxta, Michael Moody, Dominique Jenkins, Janae Smith, and Pam Pajenikang and Emily Brown holding up the research end. Um, they're an extraordinary team. All of them have been trained in the sanctuary model and are completely committed to uh, making sure that our approaches are trauma-informed. So um, the three goals that we had for the Systems for Action grant, which lasted for two years, were first of all to assess the effects of our trauma-informed peer support program, uh, which we call the network. And what it is, it's an education and training program that focuses on improving health and economic security. That's why we called it the Building Wealth and Health Network. Uh, we wanted to identify the cost savings to the TANF program and to Medicaid program, and we wanted to be able to make a case for linking these systems, which are currently not connected in terms of funding streams. And finally, we wanted to engage multiple stakeholders in order to promote a culture of health within TANF and um, to try to get more national recognition for the importance of trauma-informed programming and how to insert that into education and training programs. So TANF, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, reaches less than 30% of those who are eligible. There are a number of reasons for that, which maybe we can get into in the question and answer session. Um, but really for the past 20 years, it's been very clear that Temporary Assistance for Needy Families has not reached those who are eligible. And the focus on the work participation requirement has had very mixed success. Um, what happens is that people who um, Get, are, are eligible or sign up for TANF often succeed in getting that first job, but then they may lose it very quickly or the pay is very low or they have a lot of income volatility and then, um, or a child may get sick and then they lose that job and then they return to TANF. And there's this concept of churning this is that families are going through the system over and over again without being able to get out of poverty. Um, there are a lot of barriers for uh, people who are participating in TANF 33% have reported work-limiting health conditions. 43% report some form of disability. Um, the rates of intimate partner violence uh, are vary across state, and the, the, depending on the way you measure it, but um, it can be as high as 74% of those who are participating in TANF have experienced intimate partner violence. And also, that it's known that Many people who are um, living below the poverty level have also a lot of high involvement with the criminal justice system, um, most of the time not due to their own fault, but to the way our systems tend to work in this country. So there are many, many barriers that people who are on TANF are facing, and it's not uh, clear that the way that TANF programming happens across the country is really addressing some of these hardships that families are dealing with. This is why we wanted to uh, focus on creating a trauma-informed approach to education and training through the network. So just a quick overview on what is trauma. Um, among kids, we talk about trauma as a form of toxic stress. That's overwhelming and relentless stress for young children when they don't have adequate support to overcome it. Um, most of us who work on homelessness and food insecurity have started to adopt this concept of toxic stress 
that even though it wasn't originally thought about, people used to think about toxic stress as a form of um, dealing with abuse or neglect, but it has to do also with very severe adversity. And also another concept called adverse childhood experiences. People measure that differently, but the way that we've been utilizing it in Philadelphia is focusing on emotional and physical abuse and neglect and also exposure to sexual abuse during childhood. It can also include being exposed to violence in the home, for instance, witnessing a mother or stepmother being um, abused or having a parent or caregiver attempt suicide or having a caregiver be in prison. So these have lifelong consequences for young children who experience this. this is, these are uh, scars that children carry with them through the rest of their lives. Among adults, we call it traumatic stress, you know, dealing with internal and external factors and not having the coping mechanisms to deal with those kinds of threats. It affects the central nervous system. It has a lot to do with um, feelings of helplessness and many other issues are associated with it. A lot of us talk about uh, what we see on the surface if a person has experienced trauma. We may see people who are suffering from physical illnesses or uh, emotional dysregulation, behavioral challenges, and um, economic instability, not being able to hold down a job, not being able to focus in school. So, but what's underneath that, those of us who are focused on trauma recognize that it's exposure to trauma and loss. Um, and because of that, potentially chronic hyperarousal or inflammation in the body. Of course, adverse childhood experiences, as I explained before. Um, and we have started to add also historical trauma, understanding the, the structural violence in our systems, dealing with issues of racism, of legacy of colonialism, sexism, homophobia, etc. Those are all forms of that can cause um, trauma in the household, in the community, in our society. And that inserts itself into our bodies and brains, affects our behavior, affects our relationships, affects our ability to do well in the world. I wanted to um, include a slide that Ali Huxta, who is one of the directors at the Building Wealth and Health Network, one, that she created in trying to work with people who are um, working in education and training programs to explain this in a sort of a non-scientific way. She says that the common trauma responses are having a burst of anger or experiencing prolonged stress or headaches, anxiety, depression, being super agitated, lack of sleep, low self-esteem and self-worth. But what's really going on underneath that is that we call the members of the network members, not uh, customers or participants, but in TANF, a lot of uh, people who participate in TANF are referred to as customers by social services agencies. What it may mean is that our members are being or are overwhelmed or they're in a crisis or they maybe they're being triggered um, by a past trauma, something that someone said, a color that they've seen, a smell that they've experienced. And what we may be seeing in their behavior is a buildup of stress from the past, and it's pouring through to um, their decision making and their their work, their everyday life. So, trauma informed practice is a way of realizing the widespread impact of trauma, recognizes that the, there are pathways to recovery, it recognizes the signs and symptoms of trauma in our clients and families, also in our staff and in our systems. Uh, responds to trauma, makes sure that we are integrating the knowledge about trauma into our policies, our procedures, our everyday practices, and also it, we're working to resist re-traumatizing um, our staff or re-traumatizing participants in our programs. So how did Allie put this? She gave a story about what happened when um, one of the members showed up and she was pretty angry because we didn't have a gift card ready for her because she was filling out a survey. Um, she explains we had a member come, come to class angry because we still didn't have her gift card ready. The self-coach, that's what we call the coaches in the network, took her aside and apologized and also added, you seem really upset. Is something else going on? The member then shared that her son was in the hospital for almost committing suicide and she needed the gift card for groceries because she hadn't been able to go to work for the past two weeks. In other words, she didn't have enough money to feed herself and her kids and was very stressed. So here's Allie giving an example of how it is that our staff can resist re-traumatizing people 
um, by, you know, making sure that we're not getting angry at people for getting angry at us, making sure that we're apologizing and recognizing that maybe underneath something deeper is going on. It actually sounds very simple. It's very humanistic. Um, You would think that all of us behave this way, but it doesn't necessarily happen. So, Another way that Ali explains this to people in the, um, who are working in education and training programs is that what we do is psychoeducation. We teach everybody we know about how trauma affects the brain, the body, and our emotions. We utilize the sanctuary model, which is a trauma-informed organizational structure that holds us accountable to taking care of ourselves and to each other while working with people who have experienced trauma. We provide unbiased support. That means regardless of whatever, what other circumstances members are in and how they got there, we don't judge them for what's going on in their lives. Um, And we create a therapeutic and healing environment through the way that we set up our classrooms even and the way that we talk to our our members. We create a space that looks loved. We create a space that looks valued and cared for just, and we want to demonstrate that this is also the way that we care for the members in the network. And also one of the major components of the sanctuary model that we utilize is that we help people to feel connected. We help them to understand and relate to each other um, it, we do this. Con- the, one of the tools of sanctuary is something called community meeting, where we go around in a circle and ask how people are feeling, what their goal is, and who they're going to ask for help. And what that does is it gives people a moment to be able to ask for support or to even step up as a leader and to support someone who's sitting next to them. So um, I'm sure most of you have seen the uh, saw the video um, of what happened to a woman named Jasmine Healy who was waiting for hours in the county assistance office in New York City, uh, waiting there with her toddler. Um, she was sitting on the floor because there were not, wasn't enough there weren't enough seats um, in the waiting room, and the security guard told her to stand up when she refused to do it because she was holding her toddler and was tired. And they uh, called the police, and the police ended up. Uh, basically in a terrible struggle with Jasmine, the mom, and literally ripped the baby from her arms in order to arrest her. She spent five days in Rikers. Um, and I'm not really, all of the charges, of course, since then have been dropped. Um, but she was just waiting there in the welfare office trying to get her SNAP benefits. Um, from my perspective, this this situation that happened with Jasmine Headley is really an example of how it is that we need a culture of health in our county assistance offices and in our education and training program. Remember that in a county assistance office, people are going to apply for SNAP benefits, which promotes health and well-being. They're going to apply for Medicaid benefits, which provides health care and uh, medical support, uh, mental health support and also TANF, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. So if you want to learn more about that, you can see my uh, op-ed in The Nation that appeared in December where I talk about the punitive approaches in uh, welfare, especially in TANF itself. So this is a system that really needs um, a trauma-informed approach and uh, that really needs a sense of a culture of health. So on to the network. The major components of the network are group classes where we're helping people to provide peer support to each other. We call them financial self-empowerment classes, and there are 16 sessions. We met, we, uh, along with that, people who come into our program receive uh, or have the ability to open a savings account. We help them open the account, and if they save money, we match their savings one-to-one. And the savings account um, matching lasts for 12 months. We also provide some social work referrals, some financial coaching, but those are more ad hoc. Another really important component of the network is that we have a member advisory board. Anyone who graduates from our program is invited to join the advisory board and to help us uh, continue to improve our program, to provide outreach, to do advocacy, to talk with um, state officials about the importance of mental health in education and training programs. You'll hear more about them in a minute. So the curriculum uses this language of self, which comes straight up from the sanctuary model. There's this language of dealing with safety, emotional management, loss, and letting go. And F stands for future, and we've added in freedom. We use this type of a language in order to um, get across ideas about financial empowerment, how to manage money. What could you do to own a business? How can you negotiate good wages, earn money, and build your credit? We help people learn how to 
um, find their credit score, how to improve their credit score, um, and of course, yield benefits. This is just an example of some of the classes that we offer. I just wanted to draw your attention to this idea of future, creating your own future. We help people think about starting their own business, not think about just going to work for someone else, but that they too can be a CEO. They, they're entrepreneurial. Most people who are um, participating in cash welfare and have low-waste jobs or finding other ways to make money on the side, we want to help them think of themselves as a CEO, that they can actually gain the self-confidence in order to become an entrepreneur. So we help them learn about the basics of starting a business. That comes toward the end of uh, the network, but it's an important uh, component of the, of the program, and it also deals with that sense of future, developing a sense of future. For the match savings, we can do the one-to-one one -one match for up to $20 per month for up to a year. We're working with a credit union, um, we help the members establish group and individual savings goals, and we also do a branch uh, tour, a visit to the bank, because a lot of people don't have a trust of the banking system in and of itself. So we help to sort of help to create it, become a part of a familiar institution, a familiar type of a system, so that they can learn how to navigate the bank and their bank accounts. Our member advisory council has over 20 members, I think actually, at any given time, there may be 45 people who are active and who show up to the meetings, and we have a number of subcommittees. On to the outcomes. We, um, we have been working with people at baseline and in three-month intervals up through 12 months. Um, of course, at baseline, we ask about in their demographics, um, the benefits that they're participating in, and their exposure to violence and adversity. And what we were hoping to see, of course, through the program is any type of improvement in mental health, which we use the CESD uh, measure. We use a self-rated health. We also were hoping that it would have a two-generation effect. We knew that in the randomized controlled trial, it actually did have an effect on the children. Um, we're also measuring economic security. The major components of that include food insecurity, housing insecurity, and energy insecurity. And also financial well-being, how much uh, people are able to save, what are their financial behaviors, what is their knowledge, are they saving more money, are they, um, do they have a sense of self-efficacy with financial well-being, et cetera. You can learn more about our methods in some of our earlier um, publications. So I just want to draw your attention to the Robert Wood Johnson uh, grant funded our work on what we call phase two. Um, and there were at baseline 373 people that we worked with. Um, since we got the first, uh, since we got our grant from Robert Wood Johnson, we also won a uh, contract with the state of Pennsylvania, which was you know, part of our plan all along to make sure that public money could go into this. And uh, phase three is now still ongoing right now at the career link. We've worked with um, over 300 people, and we have probably another 50 that have signed up just this week to participate in the program. But the results I'm going to show you are the ones from phase two. And you'll see that we have a pretty good retention at the three-month mark, but it starts to fall off down to the 12-month mark. Uh, it's pretty standard for hard-to-reach populations. But most of what I'm going to show you are what has been occurring at baseline and then what happens over the 12 months. So just to make sure that, that uh, you all understand the importance of trauma and how damaging it can be, I just wanted to show you the different um, types of trauma and violence exposure that we're measuring. We're measuring ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. There are basically three categories of that. There's abuse and neglect and also household instability. An example of a question is, did a parent or other adult often, often or very often swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you? or act in a way that might you, might, made you feel afraid that you might be physically hurt. That's just an example of one of the questions. Um, we also have questions about community violence. Have you ever seen someone beat up or mugged? Um, have you seen a seriously wounded person after an incident of violence? Um, and it goes on from there. Those are just some examples. That's not the full array of questions. For intimate partner violence, we ask four major questions. Has, how often does your, in the past three months, how often does your partner physically hurt you, insult or talk down to you, threaten you with harm or scream or curse at you? And we inserted in phase three, we have a little bit of results on uh, phase two, experiences of discrimination. 
which should be recognized as another form of trauma. Uh, experiences of discrimination at school, getting hired or getting a job at work, getting housing, experiences of discrimination on the street, by the police and the courts, et cetera. So this is just to give you a sense of levels of exposure to violence and trauma among the members. Just pay attention mostly to the darker yellow line. Or the discrimination at school, again, that's a newer measure that we've inserted. Over 30% in phase three reported being discriminated against at school. Um, about 10% reported uh, physical, recent physical abuse by their partner. Aces, if you have it four or more aces, it's very severe. Over 30% of the members in the network reported four or more aces. Um, I just want to point out uh, further down the line, seeing a, seri a, a seriously wounded person after an incident or violence, about 50% of people have experienced that. So as you can imagine, the type of... Um, the type of trauma that people are experiencing, I think it would be very difficult to be able to find a job right away through the TANF program unless you have an opportunity to start working on your behavioral health, building a sense of a network, having a, a sense of um, a therapeutic environment while you're also looking for a job. So we've published several articles on the network already. These are some of the ones that we've already published. Layla Boucheri and Jerome Dugan took the lead on uh, producing the results on our trauma-informed, uh, on, our, on our randomized controlled trial. I'm gonna tell you about the forthcoming data that we're releasing. We're showing that trauma-informed peer support improves mental health and coping strategies. The network also improves food security. And we know that Health and Human Services, the Agency for Children and Families has become very interested in social capital because we have built a peer support mechanism where we know that we're building up social capital and we're able to show that social capital is a part of what's on the pathway to improving employment and reducing TANF participation. So because we don't have a control group in phase two, what, we did, what we've done is taken the uh, participants who showed up to say that they were interested in the program and we were able to break them apart into two groups. One group we call the low exposure group, they showed up to less than four classes. And the higher exposure group has shown up to at least four classes. Most of them have shown up to many more and made it all the way through the program for the, for the 16 week intervention. And so that's how we've done it. We've done these two, these two different comparison groups. We can, this way we can see the dosage effects of the network. So this is, um, uh, these, I'm not showing you the results because they're being peer reviewed. So we don't wanna, we don't wanna blow the opportunity to be able to publish. So we're not showing you our numbers, but we did wanna let you know that um, in terms of depression, people who participated in any class, there is a, um, an improvement in depression. Also, there's a treatment effect. Those who participated in four or more classes have a much greater improvement in depression. We did not see improvements in child, any kind of improvements in child development or in self-efficacy, but we sense that the improvements in depression are actually very significant. And um, if we were able to prove it, which we will do in the future, we know that the fact that we're able to improve depression through the network will produce savings in Medicaid. Secondly, we've shown that participation um, in four or more classes improves economic security, and this is a composite of food, housing, and energy security. Um, we've also been able to show that class attendance, just by attending one class, the more classes a person participates in, the less they are likely to use alcohol. We um, sense that there's been no, no improvement or worsening in drug use uh, because the data is actually quite skewed, not very many people in our program admit to utilizing drugs, so we don't see any effects there. But these are all very positive uh, results. And I'm just going straight into our um, ability to improve food security alone. We wanted to make it, to break it out by ACEs, because remember this is a program that is specifically meant for people who've experienced trauma and so we wanted to make sure that what we were doing is really helping those who had four or more ACEs. And um, it looks like we've been able to improve from baseline to 12 months 
that are, the odds of food insecurity are much less for those who experienced four or more ACEs or one to three ACEs. Overall, um, the odds of food insecurity were reduced. On to social capital. This is something we've, we're writing up and we're almost ready to submit. We have a series of questions that we adapted from Dimitri, Dimitri Williams. There are two components to social capital. One is called bridging. This is very inclusive. This is this idea of uh, a mile wide or one inch deep. This is individuals connecting from all different types of backgrounds and different types of social networks. It's a way of broadening your horizon and opening new opportunities for new resources. Bonding is being able to connect more with your family and friends, those who are very close and very similar to you, and that's the depth of your emotional and social relationships. So bridging and bonding are sort of standard, the standard components of social capital. And as you can imagine, those who are employed have higher uh, levels of bridging and bonding and those who are, compared to those who are unemployed, if you pay attention to the dark yellow line compared to the light yellow line. Same thing is for depression. Those who are not depressed have higher rates of bridging and higher rates of bonding. And those who are depressed have lower bridging and bonding. That's expected. This is um, on, in terms of our baseline, just to look, is there something going on here? And these are all very preliminary, but those who had uh, less than four classes, you can see that there was an, in, a, an improvement in bonding from baseline to 12 months. Almost the same um, improvements were found in those who participated in four or more classes. So this is actually quite promising that over time, people's bonding is improving. Bridging, uh, we're not so good at. Apparently, in terms of the research, those who are, didn't participate in uh, four or more classes, there was no change for them. For those who participated in four or more classes, improved their ability to, or, or their, experiencing, their experiences with bridging. Those were statistically significant differences from baseline to 12 months. So we suspect that social capital is on the pathway. We don't just suspect it. We're actually being able to demonstrate it. And we're breaking it up, of course, by ACEs, ACEs 0, ACEs 1 to 3, ACEs 4 plus. We know that ACEs is related to depression and that depression is related to employment. Where does the network come in? It's this, the network component of the peer support helps to build up that social capital, reduces depression, and, also there, and therefore improves employment and reduces TANF participation and TANF churn. Those are exciting results. Uh, please stay tuned. As you all know, research takes a long time to get out to the public, and of course we have to check it and double check it and get the peer reviewers to give us some feedback. We've produced two policy briefs through this mechanism. You can find them on our website, and they're um, demonstrating the importance of trauma-informed approaches, demonstrating the significance of violence to people's health and well-being, um, and we'll be publishing our research Soon, you might notice we have not, I haven't showed you any results about how we've reduced the cost to Medicaid spending or TANF spending, and that's because we couldn't do it without access to the administrative data uh, for the city. We needed Medicaid billing data and also uh, TANF data for the entire city. The day before our grant ended, we finally got the data from the state. So that was very exciting. But you can't do that. <laughs> you can't do the data analysis in a day. So stay tuned. In the next couple of years, we'll be able to demonstrate. We hope that um, there's been a reduction in um, cost to both TANF and to Medicaid. We'll see. On the horizon for the program, we are now to the point where the members of the network love the program so much that they would like to become leaders and coaches in the network. So we've built up a leadership development program for them where they're going to be participating in more advocacy and also becoming coaches in the network as we expand. We're ready to scale up. We've manualized the program. It's almost complete. We're very interested in the state being able to take up the program or any other state being able to adopt it as, as a TANF program. And um, if we can't do that, let's do a large-scale demonstration. Maybe APT or Mathematica could take an interest if the Agency for Children and Families wanted to do a much larger study. There are some challenges, however, to integrating a culture of health into TANF. I'd have to say that the first part is really dealing with um, the state systems. The Department of Human Services, they recognize 
that the punitive approach to getting people into the uh, workforce is not very helpful, especially for people who have all of these um, work-limiting conditions, such as behavioral health issues, exposure to trauma and violence. But they're pretty slow to act and integrate those changes. The state universities move slow. I think the state, at least the state of Pennsylvania, moves a little slower. Um, there's also little to no incentive to merge behavioral health with education and training um, that they can see. And if, of course, if we can make the case for cost savings, perhaps we'll be more uh, successful in the future. Also, temporary assistance for needy families is under constant threat by state legislators in the state of Pennsylvania, and I know also across the country. There's also a lot of staff turnover in the state data management systems and quality improvement systems, which makes it difficult to be able to work with the state administrative data. Now that we've been funded by um, an organization that manages the state contracts for temporary assistance for needy families in the city of Philadelphia, we're delighted that our own university systems are not agile enough to handle the invoicing mechanisms that the state requires. So that's causing some stress and tension with the contracting. Uh, also, the state puts limitations on our costs. So we cannot use state money to match the savings accounts. We cannot use the state money to provide incentives for showing up to class or showing up or um, uh, con completing homework or having uh, some small wins in, throughout the program. There's also a little investment by the state in staff training and making sure that you can have competitive salaries so you can have a wonderful team like we do on the network, so that's something we still have to work out. And finally, there's a contradictory focus on our outcomes. They, we, the TANF program is really pushing people to get employed, but they also want people to participate in our program. But in our program, we're helping people get employed so they don't participate in our program. So we're back and forth about who, which mechanism of success we can actually show. So those are some of the challenges to integrating um, a culture of health. I'd love for you all to stay in touch with the Building Wealth and Health Network on social media. Check out our website. Um, please stay tuned on the Systems for Action. The other research that's going on is really thrilling. And also really excited that, um, that you know, as we do this community participation with the members of the network, we know that uh, the Health Federation is very interested in this, and I'm very delighted that Leslie Lieberman, Lieberman is going to be giving some commentary on this. And also, please Stay tuned for CTIP. It's the Campaign for Trauma-Informed Policy and Practice. We're working uh, with various states across the country to integrate trauma-informed policy and programming. Thank you all for listening in. Thank you, Marianna. And before I turn it over to Leslie for her commentary, I'd just like to remind everyone if you have any questions for, uh, for Marianna or even for Leslie later on after her commentary, please do type them in in the chat box in your screen. And uh, for any questions that we can't get to, we'll make sure to forward them to Marianna and her team as well. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Leslie, for your comments. Great. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I am uh, really delighted to be part of this conversation. Thank you, Dr. Mamorel, for your introduction. And Marianna, I, I've known this work before, but I have to tell you that it's just so exciting to hear this presentation. It's thoughtful, it's compelling, and it's really so relevant to the work um, that I've been involved in. And you just gave a little quick shout out to Mobilizing Action for Resilient Communities, um, which is an initiative that is under the auspices of the Health Federation of Philadelphia, also funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, um, where we're really working to leverage the power of cross-sector networks um, to identify and create and implement local solutions like the building health and wealth initiative that prevent, mitigate trauma, ACEs, and foster resilience. And uh, our, I think our Twitter um, name is up there. Our website is mark.healthfederation.org. Um, I want to just uh, say a few things that really um, stood out for me in your comments, Mariana, that I, I, and I think I, because they are so relevant and I think really we should all be thinking about them in applications beyond your work, but any uh, applications uh, as we work toward um, creating more trauma-informed services and thinking about how do we um, effectively break the cycle of poverty. So the first thing that, that I think your research underscores is the prevalence and extensive trauma 
um, experienced by individuals who are recipients of services such as TANF and I think other benefit support programs. And while this isn't you know, necessarily a surprise to many of us, I think the poignancy of uh, the data that you shared um, is, is real and something that we should all be thinking about. Uh, and, and remembering that the first tenet really of, of providing trauma-informed services is to acknowledge the prevalence and the pervasive impact of trauma. And so it's really, uh, we, we have to continue to identify that and share that data um, across systems that um, serve vulnerable populations. Uh, and then the, think about designing services that are responsive to that. Um, we had an opportunity here in Philadelphia not too long ago to um, do some training on trauma-informed care for our revenue department. Those are the tax collectors because they recognized that the people that they were serving were people like the participants in, in your network, Mariana, that had um, likely experienced a lot of trauma. Now, we haven't gotten to the point of, of working with them to integrate an intervention such as yours, but just starting with the recognition and the acknowledgement uh, that this was a, a group of people who have likely experienced uh, extensive trauma, I think was a very important first step. The other piece I think that's so important uh, about uh, looking at the trauma prevalence in the group that you have been working with is recognizing that trauma and economic security are really in an inextricably, inextricably linked. And that we're not really going to be able to break the cycle of poverty or assist people with uh, gaining um, self-sufficiency, employment, unless we are really acknowledging and addressing the impact that trauma has on people who um, have experienced poverty, poverty and really providing them with opportunities to, to really address that trauma. Um, the second piece of your um, model and your work that I find so exciting is um, the model of integration. Um, we, you know, I'm a social worker by training and I live by the motto that we have to start where the client is. Um, and uh, and I, I think that your model of bringing in a place and an opportunity for people to address their trauma in an, a, a place that they already were going to be is critical and we need to really be advocating for more models like that. On the one hand, it's simple, and then yet you've just gone through the barriers, the bureaucratic barriers, the funding barriers. There are also barriers of values and turf, but we have got to continue to hammer away at that uh, and overcome those barriers. I, um, you know, I've also had the opportunity to work in an integrated behavioral health and health model, and I know that these models work, they're powerful, and we really need to be advocating uh, ways to um, do more of them. And if it really comes down to being able to do more return on investment, uh, research, then that's what we'll, we're going to have to do. Um, the other piece of your, your uh, work that I think is so exciting and also easily replicable and scalable is the demonstration of the power of peer support. Um, you know, that is a relatively low cost uh, intervention and we need to be able to find ways to provide opportunities for peers to connect in meaningful uh, ways, uh, much more in the service, services that we deliver. Um, and finally, um, what I want to say that I think is just so exciting and also uh, replicable uh, and uh, is that you um, are translating this research into advocacy. And I, and I love the slide uh, that was a couple before this last slide of, of your network members. Um, yeah, there we go, standing in front of uh, the Capitol building. Um, because I think this, uh, this notion that through kind of service delivery, we have the opportunity to um, foster opportunities to gain experience doing advocacy is, is where we need to be. I, I think advocacy is an incredibly powerful healing uh, intervention that we don't often think of that way. Uh, but Mariana, your work, not only this work, but your witnesses to hunger work is, is such a demonstration of that. And as I said at the beginning of my remarks, um, through the Mobilizing Action for Resilient Communities, we're working with many communities around the country to build these local networks um, that cross sectors. Um, and we also know that they must involve community members. And so I'm hoping that uh, things like the Building Health 
Wealth and Health Network, Witnesses to Hunger, and uh, networks such as the Philadelphia ACE Task Force can become partners in, in doing this work together. Um, and I'm going to stop there because I know there's a number of questions out there and um, happy to stay involved in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Um, so before we turn it over to those questions, though, I do want to give Marianne a chance to respond to Leslie's comment. So Marianne, feel free, or if you wanted to add something else that you also I forgot to include in your main presentation. Please do take this time. Thank you very much, um, Leslie. Thanks so much for your commentary, and it's um, it's good to know that that we we're, stri we're striking a chord with the work that you all are doing. And I think that you know it's those of us who've been long before us have been working on trauma for decades. It's, I feel like it's time we're at a tipping point where now it's we're at a place where we can start to network together. So. Um, it's heartening to hear that Mark is taking off and that you're d developing these broader networks. And I think it's not just up to the um, to the experts or the professionals to do it. It's those who've experienced the trauma and adversity. They're the ones who can help us to to get there and show us the way. So I'm delighted that you're doing that type of work, and we look forward to connecting further. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so we do have a few questions, and we just have time left in our webinar, so we'll, we'll try to get to that. So uh, let's start off with a question from Ad Adrienne, and I'll, I'll tie that in also with another question from Kate. Um, how were the participants selected? I know you talked a little about that for the phase two, where you divided them sort of into groups of those who, you know, the number of class attended. Did you sort of use the same selection criteria for the phase three study too as well, in terms of how the participants were selected? Thanks for the question. Um, for phase two, we uh, uh, recruited in two different ways. The first way where most of our participants came from, we recruited them in the county assistance office when they had, were um, told to come in to be recertified for TANF or if they were applying for TANF for the first time. And um, they, we would do an announcement about our program and then they would see their uh, a, like a caseworker within the county assistance office and they would make a choice. Do you want to be in the Strexel program or do you want to do TANF as is? And that's how we recruited most of our folks. Uh, because of some changes at the state, uh, we were not allowed to recruit that way for about six months. And because we wanted to keep the program going, we did recruit through some child care centers and community organizations, and the, um, the only eligibility criteria there was being a, uh, a person needed to be a, have a child under the age of six or to be participating in TANF, SNAP, or Medicaid, or housing subsidies. So it was a, it was a, a mix of two different types of locations, but we did really like recruiting at the county assistance office. It, we're not doing that same recruitment anymore. We're now at what's called a career link. So it's the sort of the second step. People have already been through the county assistance office and then they land to us um, and to other types of programs. And we know that we probably could work with more if we could recruit back at the county assistance office. Okay. And so tying on to that, the, the question from Kate was, would participation then in this program count as a work-related activity for work requirements in the same way as community service activities do in some places? Yes, it currently, with phase three, it currently counts towards their work, work participation requirements. Um, it took us many years to get to this point. Um, at the, in, the, in the RCT, randomized controlled trial, the state allowed us to work with a certain number of people where they just recognized that we weren't able to work with the work requirements and they it, it kind of came out in the wash because our numbers were so small we worked with 100 people so now it does count toward the work requirement the problem is however that we know that there's a lot of self-care that needs to go and in, go into this and we didn't we built the program to sort of take the pressure off of doing work participation um, up to the 20 hours uh, per week that's required for families that have a young child under the age of six so now in our program, they can come to our program, which counts towards it, but they still have to do other kinds of activities to reach the 20 hours. So it's a, it's a struggle. What I'd love to do is get rid of the work participation requirement altogether, because I think that um, it's the bean counting really gets in the way of helping families to take care of themselves and to find uh, a good job that pays well. Um, Laura mentioned that she's a Texas foster parent and also serves as a volunteer mentor teaching financial literacy to foster teens. 
Uh, she really loves the information that you've shared today in the webinar. Uh, she asks, do you have any plans to work with youth in instilling these ideas like teaching financial literacy to, uh, you know, before they become adults? So I guess expanding it to, to younger uh, participants. Yes, we're really excited. We would love to be able to work with younger people. The members of the network have told us they really wish that they had this when they were in high school um, and that they've, they're encouraging us to work with younger people and we would really love to do that. But of course, we've got to find the grant um, in order to do that, to work with the, with the adolescents. But we do have some people in Philadelphia who are working in the school district who are thinking about working with us um, on our program. And I'm glad that it resonates, and um, I hope that we can expand. And if, if you all would like to do this in Texas, we would love to send you our manuals and talk about how you can, how you can take up this model. All right, so before we get to uh, some of the questions of replicability, uh, as you and also uh, Leslie were talking about, I do want to also put in my own question, because you did mention that just recently you were able to get the uh, administrative data on Medicaid and, and the TANF that you needed to, you know, try to see the financial impact or savings that were, you know, that you could, that would, could be uh, potentially uh, yielded from this program. So the first case, I guess there's this related question from Beatrice who's, how do you identify which Medicaid health plan that the member participated in? And then I'll add my, my own question to that. Or is there a way to do that? I'm sorry. Uh, I guess that yeah, question. we did not. We did not. Um, we haven't figured that out, like who is on which Medicaid plan yet. Of course, now that we have the administrative data, we'll be able to look at that. Um, mm -hmm. And with phase two, we just asked whether a person was on Medicaid or not. So we don't know the specifics of the health plan. Sorry about that. Right. And, and so the Medicaid savings that you also will be trying to look at or the time of savings or just to the general, the, the, the savings to the program. Sorry, my computer just went dead. But um, um, sort of are you also looking at, because uh, you did talk about the positive outcomes or a lot of the uh, positive outcomes that you found from the program, but also in terms of, just teaching financial literacy in terms of their personal mm -hmm. financial uh, situations? I, I, is there plans also to sort of include that in future uh, publications or research too as well? Yes, actually we have a whole other stream of, I didn't talk about them and I probably should have. We have a, another stream of uh, publications that we're looking at. How do you measure financial health? How can you teach financial literacy? What, if you're con controlling for all other things, does financial savvy help to improve food security? Does it help to improve depression? So we are looking at that. It takes a long time to figure this all out and um, any scientists on the line that want to help us, we'd love to have you join us. Um, in terms of looking at the uh, cost savings to Medicaid and TANF, we uh, plan to do propensity score matching and to uh, work with, I don't know if Layla and Jerome on the, are on the phone and want to pipe in um, but the idea was to be able to look at uh, the cost of treating behavioral health, you know, the standard behavioral health issues that are associated with depression and see how much that had been reduced over time for the members. And then also uh, with statewide data that we currently have through propensity score matching, be able to calculate that in terms of millions of dollars. So I don't know if um, Jerome is on, still on the phone, but I would hope he could pipe in, Jerome or Layla. And I, I guess the last question we'll have, because there was yeah. a lot of mention. Okay. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I mean, go ahead. If anyone That's on your fine. team wants to answer that question. Um, and I think the last question I, I'm trying to look for it now was about replicability. And I think the question was related to if you've looked at states where the second order devolution in their TANF programs, is there possible to implementing this model at the county level first? Have you explored trying this in counties first in those states? So I think that was just well, in terms we, of, if, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the question. We'd love it. We'd love to do it county level. Philadelphia, the city of Philadelphia is a county, so we would love to be able to have this expand in Philadelphia. We've got to convince, however, um, the state and the organizations that fund the TANF program throughout in the five different career links to be able to adopt it. We started in at one career link because the, the administrators at that career link were known to be innovators. Others may be seeing this as a potential form of competition for their other programs. So there's, there's some potential turf wars. Um, we'd be very open to other states, other counties, anywhere in the United States, including Puerto Rico, 
to see if they wanted to try this, and we'd be willing to work with anybody who wants to pick it up. Well, thank you, Mariana. I think that's all the questions we have for, uh, for now, but if you have any additional questions you wanted to add, please do feel free to uh, contact Marianne and her team directly or e even through us. The S4A would be happy to forward that information to Marianne as well. So Marianne, thank you so much. We congratulate you on the excellent research you've done. And thank you, Leslie, also for your time today providing commentary. So we'd like to thank our participants. And thank you all for joining us today. We do ask uh, for those who are interested in this webinar and the slides or the presentation that these will be made available for download from the Systems for Action website, just as it has been for our past webinars. And we do hope to look forward to seeing you in our future webinars that are scheduled. So uh, we hope to see you soon. So again, thank you, Mariana. Thank you, Leslie, for your time. And we wish everyone a, a great day. And uh, hope to see you, uh, see you soon. Thank you so much. And farewell. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody.